Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the show. Uh, as you can see, the show has no music, no titles, no actors, no costumes, no sketches. Let's be honest, it's cheap. <laughs> as a matter of fact, it's so cheap when it's repeated, I will not be in it. <laughs> we can't even afford Quantel. Quantel is that uh, television image trickery. It's a kind of visual thing where you'll see a picture of the performer and all of a sudden he'll turn head over heels, spin around like a top, and the last you see him is in the corner of the screen disappearing up his own anus. <laughs> we don't have that. Thank God. How do you like the set? All it needs is a couple of wardens, a priest and a governor. At least some things don't change. There is the nectar, the juice, the fuel. Good health. I said I'd like to sample a drink, not drink a sample. This is a, 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 what we would call a new series. And in doing a new series, there's a, there actually is a tremendous amount of work that goes into the whole project. There are negotiations, uh, meetings, discussions uh, on concept or what sort of pattern that the show will take. And then eventually, when that's all agreed, there are meetings with directors and writers, special effects, lighting, wardrobe, the whole, the whole issue. There's a, this involves a tremendous amount of people. So eventually the show is actually recorded and then eventually transmitted so that you, the viewer at home, can sit there, look at it, think to yourself a load of horse shit and turn it off. <laughs> and then the, uh, what we would call on the other hand, in this uh, age of modern technology, you, you don't even have to watch it. What you can do is watch something else and record it and then watch the recording and then sit there and think, what a load of horse shit and turn it off. <laughs> I've been asked what I've been... Uh, what have I been doing for the last four years? I haven't been on television for four years. People say, what have I been doing? I actually retired. I still am retired. But to keep myself during my retirement in a, in a manner to which I'm accustomed to, I have to work. <laughs> it's, a, it's a kind of Irish retirement. People say, what, what, have I, what have I been doing over the last four years? Well, according to statisticians, over the last four years, as an average person, I sleep an average of eight hours every night. Now, eight hours over a period of four years, that's 16 months. <laughs> uh, cooking and eating takes up three hours every day, so that's six months. Telephoning people three hours a day, that's another six months. Uh, according to statisticians, as a city dweller, I probably spend three hours every day slowly maneuvering through traffic jams. So there's another three months. Uh, time spent bathing over a four-year period is two months. Shaving is another two months. Time spent on the lavatory, three months. <laughs> Not all in one go. <laughs> so that means uh, I get up in the morning, shave, go to the kitchen, eat, make a few phone calls, get in a traffic jam, come home, have a crap and go to bed. <laughs> what, what else? What else has changed over the last four, four years? Living. Do you, do you realize how dangerous living is now? Do you know that eating food is as dangerous as writing books? <laughs> Poor old Salman Rushdie. Jeez, if I was a Muslim, I'd have been dead years ago. I wonder, I wonder where he is. He's probably living with Lord Lucan. <laughs> going, going back to that kind of food issue, there was, there was an expression years ago which said, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Now we say, which came first, the salmonella chicken or the salmonella egg? <laughs> and it seems to have affected the whole food supply. Everything's affected. Meat, fish, cheese, fruit. Patty, yogurt. The only way to have a healthy life is not to eat. <laughs> Starve to death. 
At least when you're dying, you know you're not dying of anything serious. <laughs> I mean, as, gee, when you actually come down to it, doesn't it come to something? That in this day and age, the only really safe thing we can eat are the worms in the drinking water. <laughs> well, it's all this, uh, this green awareness. Everybody's become much more aware. Even that high priestess of what we would call the, the marketplace, Mrs. Thatcher, has now joined the green bandwagon. She's hectoring us on how we can do things to improve our environment. Come on, for Christ's sake. That's rather like Joan Collins becoming a nun. <laughs> and telling, all, telling us all to take vows of chastity. It's very praiseworthy, but a bit late. <laughs> do, you know, do you know the main cause, one of the main causes of what we would call the greenhouse effect that we're all going through? The loss of trees. And what causes the loss of trees? Babies! <laughs> Babies! Bloody little crapping babies! <laughs> because babies use nappies, and nappies use up trees. 1,500 nappies wipes out one tree. Over a period of two years, a baby who uses six nappies a day will kill three trees. Those little bastards should be got at. <laughs> Why do we need all these babies? The Pope, it's his fault. <laughs> he's, a, he's a celibate old Pole, right? <laughs> and he tells billions of people throughout the world about the sex life. The total purpose of the sexual life is not for pleasure. It is to propagate, to bring Catholic children into the world. No birth control. No use the pee. No use the rubber. No use the Dutch cap. I say to him, if you don't play the game, don't make the rules. <laughs> Talking about birth control, I see that America has a new, uh, new president. I'll do that again. <laughs> Talking about birth control, I see that America has a, a new president. I shouldn't have done it a second time. <laughs> I mean, is that, that Mr. Bush, is, he's quite extraordinary, isn't he? I mean, most, most politicians strive for notoriety. He's seeking anonymity. And he's succeeding. <laughs> Who was I talking about? <laughs> do, you know, do, you, do you realize that if President Bush were to drown and he was in the sea drowning and his whole life were to flash before his very eyes, he wouldn't be in it. There are other things, there are confusing things. Despite, despite uh, a lot of criticism, I actually think that the Chancellor of the Exchequer is doing a good job. <laughs> I hope he's there when this show is repeated. <laughs> Do you know, at one time, Britain was in the first 50 debtors of the world, great debtors of the world? You know that? Now, we're in the top 20. <laughs> Doesn't that make you feel proud? You're improving. <laughs> You're just behind Brazil and Argentina. Do you, know, do you know how much we owe? We owe 170 billion pounds. At least we're not the only ones. America is the greatest debtor in the world. The most affluent nation in the world is the greatest debtor. They're the most affluent debtor. <laughs> they, they, they owe billions. We all owe money. France owes money. Italy, Spain, Germany, Ireland. We're up to our arse in debt. <laughs> the Far East, the Middle East, China, Australia. We all owe billions and billions and billions. Who in the name of Christ do we owe it to? <laughs> and where did they get it from? <laughs> and then we give other nations aid. We borrow money to give other nations. Well, come on, it's lunacy. 
What else has changed over the last four years? I've, I've changed. Uh, I'm four years older. I've gone through what we would call the half century. I, 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 I don't actually, some people do object to getting old. I don't. Not when you consider the alternative. <laughs> it really is, I mean, it really is my ambition just to get old. I just want to get old. I just want to get older and older and older. And older. I actually want to get my telegram from the Queen and keep going. It's my ambition to be able to look back on my old age. <laughs> and in this, in this aging process, as we age, we all have a kind of a different, totally different attitude to what we would call life expectancy. The years in life expectancy. I mean, when you're, when you're in your teens, aging has got nothing to do with you. Aging has got to do with other people, old people. Old people get aged. And then when you're 20, you kind of think, if I live to be 40, I'll be happy. 40 to 20 year old is ancient. Decay. Christ, I'd rather be dead than 40. <laughs> and then when you're 30, you're thinking, geez, 40. Surely I'm entitled to live a few more years than 40. How about, how about 55? God, how about 55? Give me 55. I'll be happy with 55. You get to 55? 75! 75! You get to 75, you think, shit, 76, please, God, 76. <laughs> Then when you're 83, it makes a difference because you've, you've gone. <laughs> you're into a second childhood thinking, <laughs> when I grow up, I'm going to be an engine driver. <laughs> and then there's all those assholes. You remember come of those assholes who say things like, I never want to be old. I don't want to grow old. They're, they're always around kind of 30, 33 years of age. I never want to grow old. I never want to reach a situation where I'm totally helpless, helpless, incapable of taking care of myself totally dependent on other people. I don't want to reach that stage. I'd kill myself first. Crap. Because <laughs> by the time they get to that point, they're a bit gaga. They know they want to kill somebody, but they can't remember who it is. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things, as a, as a, as a increasingly, I'm a member of the older generation, uh, is that we, we envy the young. I don't envy the young, their youth, or their future. What I envy in the young, it's their energy. I mean, we older generation, we try to conserve our energy. They waste it. <laughs> I walk up the stairs, people go... <laughs> I carefully descend stairs. There's a bloody mountain goat gone by me. It's rather like being somebody with limited spending, watching somebody who's got an open checkbook. <laughs> and the whole thing, I think, I don't mind them having the energy. They don't know how to use it. That's the trouble. They have all that energy, but they don't know how to use it. I know how to use it, I don't have it. <laughs> they have this extraordinary ability to, to burn the candle at both ends. Have the capability of staying up all night. Not to mention the sexual prowess. Which is the same thing, I suppose. <laughs> the powers of recuperation. I mean, you, you, when you get old, you begin to notice the powers of recuperation are enormous. I mean, I go out in the booze. It takes me three or four days to get over it now. Walking around with blinding headaches, amnesia, nausea, appetite's gone. Bloody <laughs> tadpoles running in front of my eyes. <laughs> The young, totally different. They'll hammer 14 pints into themselves. Whack! In one go. Spend three hours in a discotheque, jumping up and down. Another hour trying to tell this female that the man that's standing in front of her, this hulk with pimples, pissed out of his mind, is Adonis. <laughs> they'll get home. They'll spend an hour, an hour and a half with their head in the bowl, vomiting. <laughs> Two hours sleep. They're up, down into the kitchen. Win the food! <laughs> and they'll sit there and half an hour they're going through a box of crispies, a loaf of bread, a pint and a half of milk, six eggs and a pound of bacon. They sit there finishing up, scratching themselves, belching, farting, <laughs> saying, when, when's lunch? <laughs> Not only in the, uh, in the aging, in the aging process, interesting. Not only 
psychologically, what actually happens as we age, we ourselves age, we, we, tend, to, uh, we tend to protect ourselves from the aging process. Um, by seeing ourselves in a different age. We, we all do it. I'm, I'm 53 years of age. Now, what, when I walk down the road, whatever psychological uh, development was in me, I don't, I don't really see myself as a 53-year-old. And this happens to us all. We all see ourselves in, in the age where we feel most suited. I walk down the road, I think to myself, maybe 30. That's how I think, 30. I'm going down the road swinging. It's 30 years old. <laughs> That's how I see myself. And then I see myself reflected in the shop window. And there's a moment of recognition, and I think, who's that old bastard over there? <laughs> and one of, the, one, of the, one of the surest telltale signs of aging is your skin. Your skin losing what is called the elasticity of the skin, the stretch. When you're young, you have a tight-fitting skin. As you get older, it gets looser. Do <laughs> you remember as a child? Do you remember as a child pulling the skin on the back of your hand? You pull it, like that. Pull it back, let it go, whack! Straight back. <laughs> I do that now, look. <laughs> Eight bloody seconds. <laughs> It's happening, it's happening all over the body. It's, it's like some great gravitational pull is on me. Everything's beginning to sag, everything. And the eyes sag, the jowls, the boobs, the belly, the bum, your bloody kneecaps. It's all drooping. It's happening to us all. Um, what is actually happening is your skin is losing its elasticity. That's what's actually happening. And people try to fight this. You can't fight it. People try to fight it by what we would call cosmetic surgery. Well, they kind of cut, pull, and then they tuck and stitch. <laughs> and that's what it's all about. Just keep on pulling. Pull. Tight, tighter and tighter and tighter. Trees grow. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Till there's no stretch left. There's nothing left. <laughs> I mean, you've seen people like Nancy Reagan, haven't you? You've seen Nancy Reagan? She's had something like five facelifts. There's nothing left in there. It's pulled tight. She looks like a bush baby on a string. Oh, You've seen her standing there. With... So, Hoover, as far as she is concerned, oral sex is finished. <laughs> there are, uh... Oh, well. There are other things in the aging process. Skin. Skin actually is quite an interesting subject. Do you know that uh, we all shed skin? Do you know that? Do you know that we shed skin? Each and every one of us, every man, woman and child in the world shed skin. Over, a, over an hour, each and every one of us shed something like 10,000 minute scales of skin. Over a three-day period, we shed one total layer of skin. This is fact. This is not makeup. This is fact. Do you know that something like 90% of the dust in the world is made up from dead human skin? How do you feel about that? <laughs> you think you're dusting in your house? You're not. You're just moving your grandmother around. <laughs> Also, also, people think in, in the aging process that uh, grey hair is a sign of aging. It, <clears throat> it can be a, uh, a feature, it can be a part and parcel of the aging process, but it's not necessarily the cause of grey hair. Uh, you can become grey because of various different reasons. It can be hereditary. Uh, a malfunction of the genes can cause greyness. Anemia causes greyness. Lacking vitamin B and vitamin F causes greyness. Vast quantities of liquids cause grayness. <laughs> shock cause grayness. Terror, fear, shock can actually, it's been recorded and a man went from being totally black haired to totally white haired in something like seven minutes. That's an interesting thing. I mean, the body hair on my body, I'm going gray on the top of my head. 
<clears throat> but the rest of my body hair is black. My eyebrows are black, my beard is black, my hands are black, my legs, black, chest, black. I noticed recently that I have, I was having a bath, I noticed that I have my first white pubic hair. <laughs> now, what did he see that the others didn't see? Can you imagine one of those little gray hairs, or little hairs standing around through the gray hair and saying, what, what, what did you see? <laughs> I saw, I saw. <laughs> ah, another one. Two grays. <laughs> the hair, the hair is, hair is interesting because I don't know it's a change in metabolism, but the hair, the texture, the quality of the hair over the years changes itself. Uh, it becomes more coarse, harsh. Um, for example, years ago, all my eyebrows were uniform in length. Well, about three or four years ago, I'm just sitting there kind of talking to someone, as you casually do, and I'm just stroking my eyebrows, just like that. And I suddenly come across a hair which doesn't belong in there. I just pull it and it goes. My Christ, it was about an inch and a half long, and he hair. Now, that was abnormal at that time. Now, it's the normal. All the little ones have gone. My eyebrows are shooting off in all directions. Half an inch, quarter of an inch, an inch. <clears throat> Isn't it amazing? My ears, which years ago had no hairs in them, now have forests, clumps, bushes. Not growing into my ear, coming out of my ear. My nose is a hair suit factory. They just keep on descending like a bloody forest. I attack them with scissors, tweezers. <laughs> Now, what in the name of Christ is happening to my body? I'm losing the hair off the top of my head and it's coming out of every orifice in my face. <laughs> and there are other things in the, in the, in the, in the aging process. Is that uh, your, eye, your eyes start to change. They suddenly go. And you, you don't realise, that's extraordinary, you don't realise it's your eyesight. I actually thought it was something to do with my arms. <laughs> I mean, I pick up a book and I go... So I went, to, I went to see an optician, and he explained in that knowledgeable way that they all have, arseholes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just, it's just a natural change. It's uh, your body evolving. It's, it's uh, nature's way of protecting you. Well, what the hell is that about? Why, why do you need to see things that are further away when you're old? Surely you need to see the things that are bloody nearer to you. <laughs> like the steps. <laughs> Other pedestrian, lampposts. I can see the bus at 300 yards. I can't find a bus stop. <laughs> I went to see this optician. Hey, I got my glasses. I got my first pair of glasses. Do you, do, do, you, do you know the most amazing thing about getting your first pair of glasses? As soon as you get these glasses, your bloody memory goes. <laughs> I put my glasses on, take them off. In this second, I have no idea where they are. <laughs> I'm walking around like a dickhead, thinking, where, where are my glasses? I, spent, I actually spent half of my life, my diminishing years, looking for bloody glasses. <laughs> I write myself little notes now. Your glasses are on the mantel shelf. I find a note, I can't read it, I've got no bloody glasses. <laughs> My, my children, my children who are caring, concerned, loving children have lost all patience with me when I'm looking for my glasses. I'm groping around like an idiot, whimpering like a fool. <laughs> you see my glasses? Oh, for Christ's sake, Daddy! You geriatric old fart! <laughs> but they're right in front of you, right under your nose. Can't you see them? If I could bloody see them, I wouldn't need them. <laughs> What I do now is when I take them off, I put them far away so I can see them. <laughs> Amazing. The optician, he said to me, he said, well, how about contact lenses? I can't even find the big bastards. How would I find those? <laughs> the amazing thing about contact I tried them. I mean, they have, they have this kind of panache for soup. They love soup. <laughs> you, you have contact lasers and 
Bowl of soup? They, they need part of your eye. <laughs> and you'll never say, excuse me, uh, I've lost my contact lens in the soup. You go through the whole thing, you go. <laughs> you're sitting opposite somebody who's thinking, what sort of a wanker is that? You ever, see, you ever see people who lose their contact? They look like Hitler. They go... <laughs> ah. The sad thing, in many ways, too, about the, the aging person <clears throat> is a memory. Memory. And how, how pompous in youth we are about memory. I remember years ago, uh, every Christmas, we, we would have kind of relatives, ancient relatives, that holy spirit of... Christmas and peace on earth and goodwill to everybody. We used to invite all these kind of idiot ants that we had, grandmothers. <laughs> and they all used to sit around. And they all talk. And they'd watch television or something like that. And there'd be some very interesting movie on. And they'd just talk the whole way through it. They'd talk about it, but they never knew what they were talking about. <laughs> they'd go, oh, uh, oh, yes. Uh, uh, mm, yes, she, she was in that. Um, uh, uh, oh, yes, she was. Yeah, that, that. <laughs> Oh, wasn't she married? Yes, that was before she went off with the other one. Not... And I'm sitting thinking, you an old geriatrics, what the hell are you talking about? No, it's me. No, I'm sitting in my own house with my children. I'm going, wasn't he in, um... That, that... <laughs> Memories, memory. It's an extraordinary thing, memory. I mean, quite recently, an example of, of, of loss of memory. Within split seconds. <clears throat> I'm in my house. I'm downstairs in my house. There is something that I want, which is upstairs. I know what it is, and I know exactly where it is upstairs. And I leave the sitting room, I walk across the corridor, go three steps up the stairs, and now I have no idea what it is I'm going to look for. So I think, well, reason this through. Don't go up and look for something you don't know what you're looking for. <laughs> Sit down on the stairs, work your way back to the point when you thought what it was you wanted. In two minutes, I have no bloody idea whether I was upstairs coming down or downstairs going up. <laughs> and age, age not only changes you physically, it changes, it changes your attitude to life. For example, now, around 1950, there was a cinema, a movie made called Sunset Boulevard, you might remember. And it starred a, a lady called Gloria Swanson. And in it, she played a 60-year-old lady uh, who had been a s star in the silent screen. And in it, she picks up a destitute young writer and turns him into her playboy. And there's, there's a scene in this movie where she seduces him into her bed. And she's 60-odd years of age, and she's lying there. Now, I'm in the cinema. I'm 17 years of age at the time. And she's lying there with a face, plus a mask of makeup. She got... Eyelashes that look like caterpillars wandered across her face. <laughs> she holds up her arms and they wobble, all that loose flesh. <laughs> her mouth is like a bloody big great slash across. And she lies there and she goes, Kiss. Kiss me. <laughs> I'm in the cinema going, <laughs> When he kisses her, I'm going, <laughs> Change in attitude. That was movie was on television recently. I'm sitting there. They go through that whole scene. She said, "Kiss me," and I'm thinking, "Shit, I fancy her." <laughs> Actually, I uh, I think that the aging process would be much more interesting. Instead of being born young and growing old, wouldn't it be better to be grow old and become young? Wouldn't that be <laughs> then you'd know how to deal with your youth when you got there. <laughs> you'd have all the energy to do all the right things. You wouldn't lose hair on the way back, you'd grow hair. <laughs> your teeth would come back, your eyesight, all those wrinkles would disappear, and you'd finish up being breastfed. Jesus, what a world of life. And in this, uh, in this, I suppose, in our lives, in our, this day and age, this, this uh, time. Time is a transient thing, and yet somehow or another, we, we want to grab a hold of it and keep it. We, we, 
We actually, in, in reality, talk about saying things like, got to save time. You can't save time. Time's gone. Motor manufacturers will, will make it as a selling point a feature of the car that uh, your car can go from 0 to 60 in 5.8 seconds, thereby saving you two seconds. <laughs> and people actually get wrapped up in this. They talk to each other. Does, does your car really go from, does it really go from, uh, from 0 to 60 in 5.8 seconds? Yes, yes it does. Shit, I wish I had a car like that. <laughs> you really saved two seconds? Yes, last week I saved a minute and a half. <laughs> when it comes to talking points, you see people racing around the country. Then people don't see the country, don't see things, don't experience things. They get in the car. <laughs> people come down from Glasgow. I did it in four and a half hours. From Glasgow to London, four and a half hours. Did you really? Yeah. How long does it normally take you? Seven hours. You saved two and a half hours. What did you do at the time you saved? I bore the arse off people talking about it. <laughs> the kitchen is a great, great area for time saving. All those time saving devices, like electric carvers. I mean, what the little crap? An electric carver. By the time you get the meat out of the oven and get this thing out of the drawer and plug it in, the bloody meat's freezing. <laughs> and you, you can't cut nicely, you can't slice, you can't carve. <laughs> Want a leg? <laughs> Goes through the bone, slowly. <laughs> <laughs> food. Food blend. What are they called? Processors? What are they called? Food processors? To chop everything up. <laughs> Potatoes. <laughs> Meat. <laughs> Blenders. Chocolate. You can whip your chocolate up in three seconds. <laughs> chocolate. Mayonnaise. <laughs> it doesn't show you the time it takes to clean the bloody thing. <laughs> I see, I was in Hong Kong recently. And I'm walking by a shop. And I see a clock. A little watch. Not a clock. A watch. I said, the changing in time. And there's nothing there. There's no face. It's just a black face. There's nothing. There's no fingers, no nails, no numbers, nothing. And I said, I said, well, what is that? He said, no, it's a talking clock. I said, what? It's a talking clock. It's a, uh, tell you the time. I said, the clock tells you the time? He said, yes. Uh, you walk down the road, all you have to do is do that, and pressure of rust, activate, Speaking for you. What <laughs> Save you all the time of doing that. You don't have to do that. <laughs> you walk down the road and you and a little voice at the end of your wrist says, 442. 442 and 30 seconds. <laughs> I mean, people, people get stuck in the watch. I mean, I'm. Watches are not watches anymore. Watches used to be something you told the time with. Now, they're a kind of advanced technological machine. A miracle of engineering. They're not just watches. They're calculators. Computers. People talk about it. Look at this. See this? It's an extraordinary watch. See, not only does it tell the time here in London, but you see this little dial over here to the left of the 12? That tells me the time in San Francisco. This one on the right here by the two tells me the time in Tokyo, and this one down here at the bottom tells me the time in Vancouver. Extraordinary, isn't it? Isn't that one of them to be able to tell the time? Do you want to know what time it is in San Francisco? No. <laughs> you don't want to know what time it is in I don't want to know what time it is in San Francisco. Yes, I would want to know. I'm in London. What the hell would I want to know what the time is in San Francisco? Oh, how about Tokyo? Piss off. <laughs> it's a calculator. Really? Yes. Wonderful. It's a musical box, memory bank. When's the, when's the, and they'll say things like, when's your birthday? I go, uh, 6th of July. All right, just a second. I'll wait. And suddenly, the calendar and the clock will go, 6th of July. And the little watch will go. <laughs> the 
There's a stopwatch. Stopwatch. I said, I said, well, what do you want a stopwatch for? He said, well, it's very handy if I'm doing something. And I like to know how long it takes me. I just, when I, when I started, I just pressed the button. And when I finished, I go, I said, well, like what? He said, well, I'm making love. When I'm making love, it's very interesting to see how long I take to make love. Just before I enter, I go. <laughs> and when I finish, I go, three and a half seconds. <laughs> Compass, you see, there's a compass there, look, north, south, east, and west. Why do you want to know? Why do you want to know? What do you want to compass for? On your watch. This one's very handy. I'd like to know where I'm going, which direction I'm going. When I'm making love, I can go north by northwest, <laughs> west, south, 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 by east, west, north. People actually say things like, shockproof. Shockproof. I'm going to get one of those shockproof watches and go, the Pope's a puff. <laughs> and they have a thing that, that work. <laughs> that they'll, they'll boast about a watch that can tell you the time at 50 fathoms. <laughs> Christ is going to ask you what time it is at 50 fathoms. You're down there. You're in the murk, the gloom. Somebody goes out of the murk. Would you like to know what time it is in 10 minutes? I mean, how we live by time, how we live, how we live by the watch, the clock. We're brought up to the clock. We're brought up to respect the clock, admire the clock, punctuality. We live a life to the clock. Isn't that right? You wait to the clock. You go to work to the clock. You clock in to the clock. You clock out to the clock. You come home to the clock. You eat to the clock. You drink to the clock. You go to bed to the clock. You get up to the clock, you go back to work to the clock. You do that for 40 years of your life, you retire, what they fucking give you? A clock! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I've come to the end of my stay on the stage tonight. Thank you for listening. Uh, whatever God you support, may he go with you. Good night. Thank you. And there's more from Dave Allen at the same time next Saturday evening. <laughs>